is the question and the place of culture is one uh, that must preoccupy our minds, particularly on an occasion such as this, when we are gathered here uh, to commemorate slightly by a few months, 100 years since the passing of the Omukama Kabareka of the Bunyoro Kitara Kingdom. We are gathered here to remind ourselves of the place of culture in the lives of our societies and when we do so we do so because we are aware that the Bunyoro Kitara and the many kingdoms that we have in Uganda and indeed in the continent of Africa have been victimized by other civilizations but we know that prior to the rude disruption of our governance systems, African kingdoms were organized. The Bunyoro Kitara kingdom was organized, and even the European historians and anthropologists who have tried to say no, recognize that they were. The Buganda Kingdom was organized, the Toro were organized, the Banyankole were organized, the Shiluk in what is present day South Sudan were organized. The Yoruba were organized in what is present day Nigeria. The Akan were organized. The Zulu were organized. We were organized. And our organization as an African people was informed by order and compassion. The history of Africa is therefore a history of welcoming other civilizations in the hope that they would reciprocate. But history teaches us that they did not. It is Ghana's Kwame Nkrumah who writes and it is not only the Europeans who started that journey of disruption and exploitation. The Arabs did it, and we don't talk about it as loudly as we should. They came. And they took us into slavery. And they castrated our men. So that when you don't see dark-skinned people in the numbers that we should in the Arab world, is because they castrated men. And we must never forget that. The Portuguese came. They were in West Africa. They were in the Congo. And we welcome them as we normally do, and we still do. And no sooner had we welcomed them then they made the claim that they had discovered us. They discovered us, they claim. They discovered our mountains, which we had lived next to for ages. The French came. The Germans came. The Italians came. The Belgians came. The English came all in their arrogance and they made their way and in what we now call Uganda they came to the Bunyoro Kitara kingdom and they were resisted by Kabareka.
And a man called Baker came and he was beaten by Kabarega. History teaches us. But then they went away and they assembled in Berlin in 1884 and 1885 and they divided us into what we now have as Uganda, as Tanzania, as Kenya. We are now 54 and still counting. But what we must never forget is that at all time we resisted. Those who say we never resisted are mistaken. We did. They planted the seeds of division. I can still remember those famous words of Nigeria's Chinua Achebe in his book, Things Fall Apart, when he says that they came and planted the seed amongst brother and brother, sister and sister, and things fell apart, and they have remained apart. They came, and they disrupted us, they told us that our God was not God. They came with a God and today when you go into many households of those who claim to be Christians or those who are Christians, you find the image of an actor called Geoffrey Hunter being received as the image of, Jeff of Jesus Christ. They came and told us that our names were not good names. And they gave us names. They came and told us that our natural features had to acquire different names. So they came and found Lake Muitanzige and say, no, it is Lake Albert. They came and found Lake, our lake with our name. They say, this is Edward. They said, another one is George. The falls which we had lived with, they said, this is Murchison. And even our national park, they called it Elizabeth. And when they went down, they found Lake Narubari and said, this is Victoria. And when they went down, they said that the falls, Mosio Tunya, was Victoria Falls. They came and told us that our culture meant nothing. And we believed them. And unfortunately, we still believe them. So today, when we are gathered here to commemorate one of the great African stalwarts, Omuka Makabareka, we must ask ourselves fundamental questions, uncomfortable questions. And those questions relate and rotate around the question of the thing that is called development. What is this thing called development? I remember not so long ago the great Tanzanian founding father Mwalimu Julius Kambarage Nyerere being interviewed about development and he said from where we sit development is not confined to the size of what the Europeans call the gross domestic product GDP that to us is not development, he said. Development cannot, in our estimation, be per capita income. That is not development. Development must not be restricted to the number of skyscrapers that we have. No, that is not development. Development cannot be understood to mean that we must go to the moon. That is not development. Development from what we see and what we call development is to have an environment where there is a spiritual, social, political and economic contentment. So let the Americans go to the moon, but we want water in our households. And I still believe that in our understanding of development, we must recognize that development is about our ability to recognize humanity in ourselves. It is those civilizations that have claimed that they were developed, that
that have visited great pain upon the world. The Europeans tell me throughout the ages which other civilization has visited pain upon humanity like the European tribes. Whether those tribes are Germans, whether they are British, whether they are Italian, whether they are English, which, whether they are the Belgians, there is no civilization other than civilizations from Europe that have visited pain upon others like they have. When in 1914, the European tribes were fighting amongst themselves, they called it the World War. When they fight themselves, they call it World War. From where they sit, what they do is the world. When they fought again between 1939 and 1945, they did not call it tribal war, they call it world war. And we were inducted into those wars. They came to us and they told us that our cultures were not good so that even today, as I speak to you, instead of addressing you in Kiswahili or Kinyoro or Luganda, they have captured our tongues that I'm now speaking to you in a foreign tongue. I look forward to the day when in an assembly such as this, I'll address you in the Kiswahili language. I look forward to that day. I look forward to the day when we shall have totally liberated ourselves, that we will be able to appreciate that indeed when we talk about development, we talk about the totality of culture. In Kiswahili they say, Mwachamila nimtumwa. He or she who abandons his or her culture is a slave. And there is a sense in which we remain enslaved. How do we remain enslaved? Just look at your names, including my very own. Look at it. Who is this individual that is called Patrick for whom I am named? Who is he? Why is it that on the day that I was baptized, they could not allow me to use my local name? Why? Why is it that when we are referring to ourselves, we refer to ourselves as Anglophone, as Francophone, as Lucifer? And right now we are even always in the business of referring to ourselves as other forms. Soon we will be Sinophones. This is what we are doing to ourselves on a daily basis in the name of development. When we run our governments and their university professors here, when they teach political science, oh, what science do they teach? They teach the ideas of somebody from the United States. They talk about Max Weber. They talk about Adam Smith. They talk about John Austin. They talk about H.A.L. Art. They don't talk about Kabarega. They don't talk about Mutesa. They don't talk about Shaka the Amazulu. They don't talk about us because we are totally dominated so that even the universities that we run, the law that we teach, the political science that we teach, the history that we teach, the geography that we teach, is so Eurocentric that on this day when we remember Omuka Makabarega, we must also exercise the spirit of slavery, mental slavery, that we may welcome a new spirit of freedom. Because if we don't, we will be dominated throughout the ages. You know, as I talk about development now, I think about this continent, this continent that has known slavery. The Omukama himself was taken away from the comfort of his kingdom and spirited to seashells. He stayed there for over two decades. When they had neutered the society, then they allowed him to come back. 
He did not get home. He died on his way. But this country for a long time did not even recognize him until later in the day. But we still recognize Prince Charles with a name in the middle of Kampala. I look forward to the day when such names shall no longer exist in the streets of Kampala. When I think about this continent and I think about how we were colonized and I think about how we regained our independence and no sooner had we regained our independence than we adopted the very same things that we inherited from the white colonizers. So that if you go to the Ugandan parliament, the Kenyan parliament, the Ghanaian parliament, the Zimbabwean parliament, the Nigerian parliament, as the great African-American John Henry said they are mimicry of what the colonizers left for us and he says and I agree we will never succeed on the basis of that kind of organization we were told and we are still told that in order to run a government in order to run a judiciary you must run it in the manner that the British taught us to do complete with the manner in which they dressed. In order to run a parliament, we must run a parliament like they did, and our speaker must still wear some woolen white thing, which people stopped wearing many years ago, but we still wear. And even when we run our affairs, we must do it in the manner that they did. We are mimicking them. And when we think we have developed, indeed we are not. That is what colonization did to us. So today, when we are gathered here to remember Omukama Kabarega, we are asking ourselves, is there not something in our tradition that we could use to change the continent of Africa? And why is that argument legitimate and necessary? It is legitimate and necessary because when Ghana became the first country to regain her independence, the first sub-Saharan country to regain her independence, always be very careful because the, the Sudanese will tell you that they regained their independence in 1956 and Ghana in 1957, but I always remind them that the real independence in Africa was with Ghana in 1957 and I can still remember those powerful words of Ghana's Kwame Nkrumah on 6th of March 1957 say that the independence of Ghana meant nothing if the rest of Africa was not free but even as he spoke those words Kwame Nkrumah was quite clear he was clear that flag independence, the mere fact that we have the Ugandan flag or the Kenyan flag or the Ugandan national anthem or the Kenyan national anthem or the Ghanaian national anthem or the Nigerian national anthem was not sufficient. That there was something else. And he reminded us in 1965 that Africa was getting into the most dangerous stage, the stage where the former colonizers would become more deadly through the neo-colonial project. No sooner had he written his book than they overthrew him. No sooner had he written his book than they started destroying what we had inherited from them. So those of you who are students of history will remember the 1960s. You will remember in 1961, the Congolese thought that they had regained independence under Patrice Emery Lumumba. They killed him after nine months. The Togolese thought that they had regained independence under Silvanus Olympio. They killed him in 1963. 
The Ghanaians thought that they had regained independence in 1957. They overthrew Nkrumah in 1966. They thought in Nigeria that they had regained independence with Namdi Azikiwe and Abubakar Tafawa Balewa. They overthrew him in 1967. The Malians thought that they had regained independence through Modibo Keita. They overthrew him in 1968. The Algerians thought they did so through Ahmed Berbela. They overthrew him in 1968. Africa, as I speak now, and I want you to cast your eyes across the continent of Africa and see the crisis of governance and therefore begging the question, is there a place for African culture and governance? Tell me whether there is peace in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Tell me whether there is peace in Sudan. Tell me whether there is peace in Northern Mali. Tell me whether there is peace in Somalia. Tell me whether there is peace in Cameroon. Tell me whether the Europeans are not telling us what to do. Tell me whether they do not send their agents across every country. Tell me whether the IMF and the World Bank are not trying to interfere in our affairs. Tell me whether they are not telling us who a man is and who a woman is. Tell me whether they are not telling us what to wear. Tell me what are they not telling us. They are telling us that if we don't have culture, they'll give us their culture. Tell me. This is the state in which we find ourselves. And therefore, today, when we are assembled here to remember Omukama Kabarega, and we ask ourselves whether there is a place for culture in development, we owe ourselves a duty to define what culture is. You know, European anthropologists, they are the notorious ones. They tell us that when you talk about African culture, they have no culture. They could not write, not true. When the Europeans were living in caves, we already had the Benin Empire longer than the Chinese walls. We already had the Monomotapa Empire. We already had the walls of Timbuktu. Before the Europeans knew whether it is the earth that went round the sun, the Dogon already knew astronomy as it is known today. They knew when they could not write, the Africans had already identified the value of zero in mathematics. When they did not know about Caesarean section, operations of that nature already taking place in the continent of Africa. When they were dying in snow and in ice, in Ethiopia, in Axum, they were already building the underground edifices in Lalibela. They were. They were building pyramids in Sudan and in Egypt. There are already libraries in Carthage. Pythagoras and all these people were already learning their philosophy from Orunmila among the Yoruba. We were there. We had a culture that was complete, complete with science, complete with mathematics, complete with the arts. And when they say we have no art, they forget that they have stolen all of them and they are to be found in the museums in Europe. If we had no culture and if we could not do the thing they say we could not do, why were they plundering the thing that they plundered? Why? Because we had a culture and what you do is that you destroy a people's culture and then you create another culture 
and make them think like you want them to think. This is what they did, not only to us who remained in the mother continent, they did it even to our brothers and sisters who are taken to the Caribbean, those who are taken to the Northern America, those who went to Southern America, they did it and they took away our language. And if you doubt me, I want you to watch Alex Haley's roots and see how the main character Kunta Kinte was beaten that he may abandon his name and acquire a new culture. But those who have a culture and those who believe in it will never abandon it. That is why we are remembering Omuka Makabarega because he's too tall. Those of you who do not know will remember that incident in a hostel where the Omukama's arm had been amputated and he kicked one of them. The time to kick them is now. The time to kick them is now because when we kick them, then they'll realize that our culture was not dead. Our culture was merely in comatose. And we are beginning to rise. And we are beginning to redefine what development is. The great Ghanaian Nana Kobina Nketia the fifth has written a book which I commend to all of us. The place of culture in governance, the Ghanaian example. And he tells us that he has, over the years, looked at governance in Africa, just like we have. And the governance structures that we inherited have not served as well. If you look at Uganda, since she earned her political independence, the history of Uganda is replete with painful moments. The history of Sudan, painful moments. Somalia, Painful moments. Ghana, painful moments. Congo, painful moments. Rwanda, painful moments. Burundi, painful moments. Nigeria, painful moments. Algeria, painful moments. Liberia, painful moments. South Africa, painful moments. Zimbabwe, painful moments. It has been a history of pain because our culture was taken away. And when we thought that we had a solution to our problems, a new wound appeared. How many of you remember in 1980s when they came here and told us the solution to the African problem is multi-party politics. And we believed, we formed parties. In the Democratic Republic of Congo at one time, there were 233 of them. We formed them. We started holding elections. Then we discovered that in Africa, we can hold elections. You can have the highest number of votes. But he who is announced the winner is the winner, the number of votes notwithstanding. We discovered that. Then we are asking ourselves, what can we do? If this foreign culture has failed to solve our problems, we thought that when we regained independence using other people's culture, our education would help us. Today, we have many graduates from our many universities, but yet we can't solve our medical problems. In Uganda, it is only those who can afford, cannot afford medical attention in Europe or India or Dubai or South Africa who go to Murad. In Kenya, it is the same. In most Africa, it is the same. 
So even the promises we made to ourselves about development in medicine, we have not realized them. Then we said we would have education and we have universities and we teach engineering in those universities. But when we want to build roads, we want to build the expressway from Kampala to Entebbe. It is not the Ugandans who do it, it is the Chinese who do it. When we want to build the expressway in Nairobi, it is the Chinese who do it. When we want to build anything in Africa, it is the Chinese who do it. What happened to our engineering? When we want to do anything, we still depend on them and our problems still continue. We still send our young men and women to the Arab world, to Saudi Arabia, to Qatar, to all those other countries. And those who we don't send take themselves there by crossing the Mediterranean Sea. What happened to us? Do we still have the spirit of Omukama Kabareka? Oh, we are weak and conquered and captured. This is the question that we must ask this morning or this afternoon. What is the place of culture? There are those who say that Africa is too diverse. There are too many cultures. Which one will we adopt? Is it that of the Bunyoro Kitara? Is it that of the Baganda? Is it that of the Batoro? Is it that of the Basoga? Is it that of any of our many communities or the Zulu or the Kosa or the Pedi or the Kakan or the Yoruba or the Temne or the Mende we ask? Who said that we cannot have a mixture of those cultures who said who said that we cannot borrow that which is good in the toro culture or the yoruba culture who said that when we combine them we cannot come with a system that will then fit us who said who is telling us that today as we remember our mukama kabarega we are reminding ourselves that we can do it. We can do it because history has demonstrated that it can be done. You know, they came and told us several years ago that there was something called Millennium Development Goals. There were eight of them. Then they reigned their course. Then they increased. They did not reduce. They became 17 now sustainable development goals. And those goals said the things that we knew. We knew how to plant trees. We had an idea of what medicine is. We knew about education and we still know. We knew about climate change. We knew how to deal with sustainable development and sustainable environment. We knew. But they tell us you did not know. We must meet and the Europeans started inviting us to meetings from 1975. The most recent was in Dubai the 28th and we go to such meetings and when we come back we marvel at what we said now that Uganda has discovered oil and every African country is discovering oil they are telling now we must leave oil alone we must now embrace other things the role of culture in development I'm suggesting to us that the time is now 
that Africans must look for a solution to governance. I must commend the current administration. They came and found that cultural institutions had been burned and they restored them. That restoration was the beginning of the realization that a people without a culture cannot go anywhere. But I would urge this administration and coming administration that cultural institutions must have enhanced roles in governance. Cultural institutions must be given stronger positions in governance because it is only when you do so that you will begin to see them in their full splendor. You know, in many African societies, and I say this with all due respect to heads of states in different African countries, you can go to Nigeria, and the president of Nigeria makes a pronouncement saying all the Yoruba people must be inoculated against tuberculosis. And when you go back, you'll discover that the response is only 20%. But when the Oni of Yoruba says all Yorubas must be inoculated, the response is 90%. The same thing here in Uganda. There are certain things which if the traditional rulers say, the people will obey. Why do they obey? What is it? That thing is the thing that we must discover. And that thing, if we mix it with the kind of governance system that we have, is going to lead us in the right direction. I still do not have an answer, but I think that there is something in it what is it that the Omukama Kabarega has, that the Kabaka of Buganda has, that the Oni of Ife has, that the King of the Mazulu has, that the King of the, Mswa, the, the Swati has, that when they speak, people obey? What is it? Why did we lose it? Can we regain it? It is not to say that all traditional rulers were perfect. No, there are certain aspects of culture that we must jettison. But there are certain positive aspects of culture that we must embrace because culture is dynamic. And I'm suggesting to all of you who are gathered here today that the time is now. The time is now for Africa to realize that there is a place of culture in modern day medicine. The time is now for Africa to realize that there is a place for culture in education. The time is now for Africa to realize that there is a place for culture in politics and governance. The time is now that Africa must realize that there is a place of culture in resource management. The time is now for Africa to realize that there is a place for culture in giving pride of place to our women in governance. The time is now for Africa to realize that there is a place of culture in ensuring that our family is retained. The time is now for Africa to recognize that if we do not protect ourselves, other cultures will come and dominate us. The time is now for Africa to realize that our languages must be protected, otherwise we'll be speaking Chinese and Indian as our mother tongue, although they were never our mothers. The time is now. The time is now, therefore, for us to wake up in the knowledge that we must instruct our institutions of higher learning to begin to investigate what it is that we are teaching. Several years ago, a great Nigerian who is a singer called Fela Nikula Pokuti sang, Teacher, don't teach me nonsense. For too long now, many of our institutions have been teaching us things that we ought not to be taught. 
we must ask ourselves now what are we teaching our young men and women the Koreans are doing it the Chinese are doing it the Indians are doing it the time is now for we Africans to do it the time is now for Africans also to begin to patent some of the things that we have how is it that the clothes which are Africans are patented by the Chinese if you are not very careful even these dances which are Bunyoro dances will be patented by Chinese so that when you want to dance the Bunyoro Kitara dance you've got to seek authority from Beijing the time is now for us to begin to understand that intellectual property goes beyond culture and that it must be given its recognition. So my fellow countrymen and my fellow Africans, the question that we are here to ask this afternoon is this. If Africa desires to grow sustainably, how can we, leveraging on the spirit of Omukama Kabareka, attain it? Who was this Omukama Kabareka? Who was he? He was a personification of courage. And today, I'm asking you that we must embrace courage. Cowards die many times. And I'm urging you this afternoon, if we are going to allow culture to dominate our thinking in the realization that culture is not static, I'm asking you to embrace and to remember Omukama Kabarega because he was courageous. Today, I'm asking you to remember the memory and to give pride of praise to the memory of Omukama Kabarega because when it was necessary he was a diplomat. I am asking you that because it is necessary to be diplomatic we must embrace the spirit of diplomacy because it is only by embracing the spirit of diplomacy that you are going to ensure that you get what you deserve. Today as we remember Omukama Kabarega, I want you to remember that he was an example for others. Those who are students of history will remember that in as much as he learned from the Toro, the Toro learned from him and the Buganda learned from him, I want you to remember that that is necessary. I want you to remember that Omukama Kabarega was also compassionate even when he used violence and force at certain times. In other words, there comes a time when instead of turning the other cheek, you must use the other fist. I'm now telling you that we as Africans must ask ourselves, when is it the right time to turn the other cheek and when is it the right time to use the other fist? And I'm saying that you can do so by ensuring that you follow another quality of Omukama Kabarega he was resilient. Many of you would have died in seashells. He stayed there for 23 years in an environment that was hostile. But he said, I'm not going to die in a foreign land. Although he died here in what is territorial Uganda, he was on his way home. I am reminding us that we must never forget our home. Because if you forget your home, you are a slave. I have no doubt in my mind that if Africa is to grow, Africa must embrace culture. If Africa is to realize our potential, we Africans must embrace culture. And I am asking Africans as we go forward, we must be warriors for culture. We must be warriors for that which is true. So those of you who are Baganda here, be proud Bagandas. Those of you who are Toros, be proud Toros. Those of you who are Basoga, be proud Sogas. Those of you who are Zulus, be proud Zulus. Those of you who are Luos, be proud Luos. Those of you who are Lango, be proud Langos. And those of you who are Bunyoro, because we are in your midst, be proud Banyoro, because it is only in that way that combined together we shall produce an African spirit. And in the spirit of Africanness, 
I can tell you it is not going to be easy. There are going to be many roadblocks. We will rise and fall. We will rise and fall. We will rise and fall. But ultimately, we will stand and history will remember us as those who rise and rise and rise. God bless you.